I'd like to take the opportunity to first thank everyone for inviting me and um, for organizing this wonderful event. I'm truly honored and very grateful to be here tonight. When I received the email invitation a couple of months ago, my first thought was like, oh, they must have sent it to the wrong person because there are so many um, female scientists in Switzerland doing really um, state-of-the-art and really innovative research. So why would they choose me? Because I ne never really considered my career path to be bumpy or difficult at all. So I was just about to trash the email when I decided to give it another thought. And all of a sudden I was facing this cascade of impressions and emotions when looking back at my um, professional trajectory because I realized that actually it hadn't been easy at all. If anything, it was really a struggle. And I also realized that I was kind of triple punished. First for being a woman, which per se I never considered being a problem. But being a woman doing sex research um, that was quite a stigma, yeah, because most of the people um, had this stereotype of um, a woman wearing ropes and sandals and being quite alternative. And the triple punishment, um, being a woman who does genetic research of human sexuality, uh, which people usually associate with weird stuff like that and really is kind of stigmatized still. That really meant pushing the boundaries of what people were able to handle and even nowadays are able to handle, and especially also within the scientific community. And I also started realizing that people were kind of treating me differently, you know, interested in collaborating for every other reason than really wanting to collaborate, or at least not on a professional level. Um, so consequently, I had um, the feeling like I have to work harder, I have to invest more, I have to be more aggressive and more pushy to really stand my ground and establish sex research or genetic sex research as a legitimate um, research area within science. So I thought, yep, yeah, okay, I take the opportunity and I come here and I say something that hopefully will be inspiring to some uh, people here in the audience. Um, Coming up with a list of innovative ideas on how to foster women's participation in STEM really was kind of challenging because I really believe that there are so many women and organizations working on it and doing a fantastic job. And I really didn't want to stand here and just repeat already implemented policies or uh, you know, postulating kind of washy, worldly wisdoms, although I'm afraid I might do so eventually but instead talk about my own experiences and um, what I thought really helped me and where I would have wished for more help. And because I'm a scientist after all, I sat down and I started drawing um, a lifeline and um, started drawing those different systems that I believe, or factors that I believe influence not only our biography, but also um, our education, our development, and also our job and future aspirations that we have. And this is what came out. Yeah? So it looks something like that. Now, I consider all the factors being really important, but for me, clearly, there is one factor that sticks out, but I'm going to talk about that a little bit later. So, being a geneticist, I realized that nature and nurture are always interacting, right? But there is something like a biological disposition or predisposition, like um, being interested in certain things or being very skillful in certain areas. And I really think, oh, if we look at the, at the survey that was conducted in the US in 2012, you see that 74% um, of women who were questioned actually expressed being interested in STEM careers. Yeah? And I really believe that it's those 74% that we need to target, not the 25% that not really are interested and kind of waste our efforts in them. Because what we also see is that almost half of them are kind of hesitant in entering a career in STEM because they fear that they can never compete um, with men in this very male-dominated world. So bottom line, not everyone is a born scientist, and I don't think everyone should be. And uh, I think we should acknowledge this individual variation also in mm, career interest, if you want so. But also do believe that we have to kind of support and invest our efforts in those people who are interested. Because in the end, um, interest and passion really are the best motivators and, for me, the best predictors for success. Then, of course, we have the environment, so we have parental support, but this is sometimes tricky as well because, mm, 
you know, you cannot expect parents to be like really knowledgeable in science or really um, excited about science. So what they really need to provide is, in my view, um, emotional support, you know, uh, being attentive to the child's wishes and um, dreams and try to provide them with a feeling that barriers can be broken. And then, of course, we have um, the role of teachers and early school education. So, so we really need um, motivated, enthusiastic and positive teacher, as well as appropriate um, curricular content so that science in the end becomes kind of breakable and playable and real and not just something that is written in a book. But for me, the most important factor is actually mentorship because having a desire or having a dream is okay, but what you really need is someone who takes care of you and someone who supports you in this path. Now, a lot of people always ask me what made me go into sex research and the answer is fairly easy because if you have like 10 books in front of you and you know one is about eating disorder, the other one is about schizophrenia and you always grab the one that is related to sex, that tells you something, right? And I was trying to express or um, express this wish or this dream to my um, to my supervisors, my academic supervisors, which all were uh, shaking their heads and were saying, oh no, uh, don't do that. Um, follow more orthodox um, career path and uh, try to look at more conventional research areas because otherwise you will never be able to establish a career. Well, thank God I'm kind of stubborn and maybe emotionally numb to discouragement and rejection. <laughs> because I thought, okay, if I can't find it here, I just go abroad. So I went to the UK and I was really, really lucky to have met um, my former doctor father, who was just the most incredible mentor that anyone could wish for. He not just supported me, but he really gave me also the freedom to develop my scientific creativity and really do what I wanted to do. And he also kind of prepared me for the, let's say, more sensitive aspects of being a woman in science. So talking about mentorship, invariably the question uh, arises as to the need for role models, right? So role models that kind of break um, or, or challenge the prevailing stereotypes and the lingering um, gender stereotypes. But related to that need for role models are a bunch of questions like, is there such a thing as a role model? And if yes, what would be the perfect role model? And does a role model for women need to be female herself? And I'm personally a bit skeptic um, regarding this whole role model thing because um, I sometimes feel that um, we're entering a danger that we are establishing kind of new stereotypes by saying, okay, so a scientist nowadays, a female scientist, is omnipotent, she's hot, she's sexy, she's clever, she's socially competent and tough. And this is something that other women uh, might start idolize and try to follow their footsteps and eventually feel a lot of pressure herself. So for me, uh, a good role model is not someone smiling at you from a magazine or someone visiting school and talking about a career or standing here talking 10 minutes about their own path. For me, the real role models are mentors that really are there to support the person the ones that are supportive and encouraging, help them build up self-confidence, listen to their ideas and visions, and eventually also acknowledging individuality. And I'm aware that sometimes that's not so easy, especially if you're in academia, because I see it myself. I have my students and I really want to provide them the best supervision ever, but of course you have so much other work to do. But then I think there's nothing more rewarding than seeing how they are kind of spreading their wings and slowly but surely following their dreams. And this is basically what keeps me going. And because time is short, I could go on waffling for at least another hour, but uh, I would like to thank you for your attention.